All right, Crystal, what's on your radar? Well, there is exciting new research revealing just how transformative psychedelics could be from patients suffering from mental illness. So here is the very latest. A new study found that MDMA, also known as ecstasy or molly, was wildly effective in treating PTSD. What's more, the drug seemed not just to ameliorate the symptoms of PTSD for those who are suffering from it, it actually seemed to get at the root causes, helping survivors of trauma to address and heal psychological wounds, easing their torment. The numbers here are absolutely astounding. Two months after receiving MDMA as part of a therapeutic regime, including traditional talk therapy, 67% of patients no longer even qualified for a diagnosis of PTSD. That compares with just 32% of the control group. Typically, even the very best drug interventions in psychotherapy only achieve modest results. So this level of impact is nearly unheard of. As one of the Johns Hopkins researchers put it, quote, this is about as excited as I can get about a clinical trial. There is nothing like this in clinical trial results for a neuropsychiatric disease. This clinical trial significantly could put MDMA on a path to achieve FDA approval as a treatment for PTSD. And it comes on the heels of promising studies on the impact of psilocybin. That's the active ingredient in so-called magic mushrooms. A recent study found that psilocybin was wildly successful in treating depression with patients experiencing a 50% reduction in symptoms a full month later. This new research does not appear to have been a one-off either. Other small studies have found similarly encouraging impacts. One note on terminology here. So some consider MDMA to be a psychedelic, some don't. It acts on the brain in a different manner than other psychedelics like shrooms and LSD. But researchers theorize that all of these drugs seem to be having such a profound impact because they actually improve neuroplasticity. They send adults briefly back to the childlike state of wonder and surprise and new neural pathway creation that can short circuit destructive patterns of thinking. In other words, as was promised by the counterculture movement of the 60s and 70s, they expand your mind. This research has been a long time in the making. In fact, while it is being heralded as groundbreaking, and certainly it is, the truth is it represents more of a rediscovery of previously known benefits which had been erased and suppressed by a campaign of moral panic that led to the complete ban of these substances. According to Michael Pollan in his book, How to Change Your Mind, psilocybin and LSD were heralded as potential wonder drugs of psychotherapy back in the 50s and 60s. During that era, over a thousand studies with more than 40,000 participants sought to understand what impact psychedelics could have on the brain. Research was so widespread and so mainstream that in 1966, CBS produced an hour-long special on research that was happening in Spring Grove, Maryland, in which LSD was administered to mental health inpatients. This research was sponsored by the federal government, and it went on for more than a decade. LSD Day in Cottage 13, a building on the grounds of Spring Grove Hospital. The tablets in Ott's hand each contain a microscopic trace of LSD. For all the sensationalism that has surrounded LSD, the experience itself looks undramatic. The drama is internal. You can go back even further, though. Shrooms were used as part of religious practices in Mesoamerica for thousands of years. Aztecs referred to them as genius mushrooms, divinatory mushrooms, and wondrous mushrooms. This use was erased and, in fact, criminalized by Spanish colonialists and missionaries who felt that shrooms encouraged paganism and communication with demons. Nevertheless, religious and sacred use quietly persisted with the drug and its impact rediscovered by white people in the 1950s. Psychedelics association with the counterculture movement, however, doomed them for legal use for decades. Soon, the media moved from covering the promising research to amplifying complete falsehoods, like the idea that these drugs could mix up your chromosomes, they fixated on bad trips, and they scaremongered about psychotic breaks. As for MDMA, it was first invented by the drug company Merck in 1912, but it fell out of knowledge until the mid-70s. Then, a psychedelic chemist tried it on himself and shared it with a psychotherapist who thought it could advance therapeutic benefits. The promising results started to flow in, but once MDMA was adopted as a club drug integral to the rave scene, moral panic again ensued and it too was criminalized and research suppressed. In the past 15 years, however, psychedelics have started to get a new life in the scientific community thanks to a groundbreaking Supreme Court decision back in 2006. In that decision, the court decided that psilocybin could be used in religious ceremonies 
and that the federal government did not have a compelling reason to halt the practice. Now, this decision applied to long-standing practices, but also to relatively new practices and relatively new religions. That decision paved the way back to some modicum of mainstream acceptability, slowly opening the door to more research, significant policy gains in the movement to decriminalize, and the precipice we stand at now as the FDA moves closer to accepting the therapeutic value of some of these drugs. Activists and scientists who've been in the fringe wilderness for decades are suddenly being quoted in the New York Times and are at the forefront of a movement rapidly gaining traction at times in a bipartisan manner. This is all tremendously encouraging. But I also can't help but think of how many millions of people might have been helped, had their pain eased by these substances in the ensuing years. If the media had sought the truth, rather than accepting the moral panic propaganda hook, line, and sinker, if the politicians had not cynically exploited this fear for their own war on drugs purposes. And even now, as the medical benefits come increasingly into view, I hope psychedelics aren't reduced to just another pill in the big pharma arsenal. There's a reason why psychedelics have persisted in practices of the sacred over thousands of years. There's a reason why nearly every human sect in history has created rituals around conscious altering substances. And at a time when late stage capitalism has stripped meaning, connection, and the sacred out of our lives, it's not only those with diagnosed mental health issues who might benefit from a little trip into the ego destroying, love imbuing, neuroplasticity enhancing world of psychedelics. In modern America, a little mysticism might be exactly what the doctor ordered. And Zagra, part of what is so fascinating to me is that we actually knew all of this mm -hmm. like decades ago. And basically the media, complicit with politicians, just bought into the moral panic around these drugs, didn't question it at all. And so the benefits that had been chronicled before and were known to societies over thousands of years, but actually you know, studied and researched in the 50s and 60s, completely erased until the Supreme Court decision kind of starts to open the door again in 2006. The recent research has been really interesting. I've mostly been exposed to this via Joe Rogan and actually piqued my interest. So what I, I think it's important for people like me who are concerned about drugs and concerned about the impact on society to differentiate because there are drugs like alcohol, cigarettes, and marijuana, which I would consider like net negatives. Now, when we're on regulation, whenever it comes to that, that's very important. But on psychedelics, there's not a recreational use culture around it. So treating it with the same sort of at least even skepticism that you would on something else doesn't really make any sense, yeah. especially whenever these are not like enhanced and chemically altered to the way that a lot of those ones are currently. However, I would say what's happening to psychedelics is exactly what's happening to marijuana, which is that the subhead of this story in the New York Times is Wall Street wants in. They're mm -hmm. pouring big money. That's exactly what big tobacco is doing whenever it comes to weed and yeah. chemically altering, turning it into a ca uh, commercial substance. I actually think that's probably the worst thing you could do. If you want to maintain the psychiatric experience, I think they just decriminalized psychedelics here in Washington, D.C. They did. And the reason why was specifically what you're talking about. And I anecdotally know people who suffered from PTSD um, and had to go, I think it's called Ibogaine, which is a, another psychedelic, which is legal down in Mexico. A lot of veterans, I heard this both firsthand and anecdotally from people, have found that to be very useful. Yeah. And so look, I, I'm for people like that in particular, and really anybody, if you're suffering for something, and I mean, I am extremely skeptical and dubious of SSRIs and other sort of legal pharmaceutical drugs whenever it comes to anxiety and more. Yeah. I think those are probably 10 times more harmful. No. Uh, Not only that, but the research is yeah. extremely mixed over whether those things even oh, really I, work. I, I, um, yeah, I, I don't. I would never. I, like if I had a kid or something, like I'm not giving them any of that stuff. The no studies yeah. so far, and again, it's it's early days because this research was basically right. you know pushed off of pushed down of possibility for decades and decades. But the studies show, so far show. Um, these psychedelics to be tremendously more powerful in not only just alleviating symptoms, mm -hmm. but actually, again, changing the neuroplasticity of the brain so that people can address and heal right. from the trauma that they've suffered. There's a couple things that are really important about what you said. Number one, um, psychedelics aren't, haven't been found to be addictive. Right. So it is less of a concern when you're thinking about like drugs and addi uh, the addictive quality and how that can destroy people's lives. I think that's significant. Your point about capitalism very well taken because that was my concern in reading that New York Times story as well. It's already like, happening. Yeah. It ruins, I mean, capitalism it ruins freaking yeah. everything. Vicodin. And so, yeah. yeah, it just ends up being like, you know, your psychedelic experience brought yeah. to you by Pfizer and it's they spend all I kinds of reasons. I guarantee you it's going to happen. I mean, right. that to me isn't a reason to not legalize and decriminalize criminalize yeah. these drugs. 
we got to figure out a way to open these markets without having literally everything ruined and destroyed by capitalism. Um, I also would say, look, just because they're not addictive doesn't mean they're not something to be like, yeah. This is not something to be casual say, about. I'm glad you said that too. It's like you shouldn't screw around. I mean, there are people who've had some really bad, well, not bad experiences, but like you don't know what you're getting into. Um, right. And so part of what's really important is to have be take the right dose, to have the right setting, a place where you're comfortable, a place where you're going to be safe. Like none of these things are to be done casually. But I almost think one of the most interesting parts about this is just the way that this was all completely erased for so many decades um, and is now just being rediscovered. And I also think it's really interesting the dynamic that our commitment to religious freedom actually played in the Supreme Court opening the door back to this research. So um, hard to understate what a sea change this is and the way that people have been thinking about psychedelics. And obviously you see places like DC and other states around the country starting to exper- experiment with decriminalization. Even Rick Perry down in Texas yeah, said he wanted right. to study the impacts of psilocybin. So there's a little bit of a bipartisan impetus around this um, as well. So it's pretty dramatic. The change in thinking and approach to these drugs just over the past few years. Yeah, I haven't read a lot about it, but I do encourage people. There was an episode with Joe Rogan with a guy named Brian Murakescu. He wrote a book called The Immortality Key around the role of psychedelics in early Christianity. And there was another one, I'm forgetting his name. He's a vice journalist who experienced horrific PTSD. Mm. And he went through some of the legally uh, FDA approved MDMA treatments and had some interesting experiences. They were both on Rogan's podcast. Check it out. Yeah, absolutely. And Michael yeah. Pollan's book, How to Change Your Mind, was yeah. a tremendous resource for me in writing this radar as well. All right, Sagar, looking forward to your radar. That's next.